Welcome to Inside Analog Photo. I'm your host, Scott Shepard. The Inside Analog Photo radio program is all about the traditional photographic process. We talk about all aspects of analog photography, including the hybrid workflow. You can find out more information over at www.insideanalogphoto.com. And of course, Inside Analog Photo is brought to you by Fujifilm, making life more colorful. These guys have the coolest instant photography materials known to mankind. They have, of course, the pack film and three and a quarter by four and a quarter and four by five, color and black and white. They have the Instex systems in the wide format, the Instex 210 camera and film, and of course, the Instex Mini in the Instex Mini 7 and the Instex Mini 25, both in color film. Beautiful stuff. There's nothing cooler than instant photography. You get a print because if you don't have a print, you don't have a real photograph. This is great fun stuff. This is great for art. This is great for business. This is cool stuff. You definitely want to check them out over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional, making life more colorful. Our friends over at Photo Publicist, providing worldwide publicity, strategic promotion, social media marketing, and business development for the photographer, turning photographers into celebrities. You can find out more information over at www.photopublicist.com. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab for the highest quality work known to mankind anywhere on this planet. Unbelievable developing, scanning, and of course, output on high quality Fuji Crystal Archive. Unbelievable cool stuff these guys are up to. And remember, you don't have a photograph unless you have a print in your hand and you need to print your pictures. This is important. You need to supply proofs to your customers and even print your own work because it's not about looking at it on a monitor. It's about holding a print in your hand. Definitely check these guys out at Richard Photo Lab, of course at richardphotolab.com. Our friends over at DR5, DR5 Chrome, black and white, developing that turns your black and white neg into, that's right, black and white chrome. Unbelievable stuff, www.dr5.com. Our friends over at Upstrap at upstrap-pro.com for the camera strap that will not slip off your shoulder, guaranteed bar none, the coolest strap around. Our friends at Iger Studios for the finest quality drum scans known to mankind, Iger Studios. Dot com. Our official media partner, APUG, the analog photography user group for all things traditional photographic process on the web, www.apug.org. And our official philanthropic partner, George Eastman House, International Museum of Photography and Film, over at www.eastmanhouse.org. Today on Inside Analog Photo, we're going to be here with John Ruder and Tracy Storr. We're talking news today about the 20 by 24 Polaroid. That's right. There's going to be brand new cameras manufactured by the Mammoth Camera Company for the 20 by 24 studio project. Brand new 20 by 24 cameras for the most legendary analog process of the 20th century. And of course, we're going to be joined today with John Ruder, President and CEO of 20 by 24 Studios, and Tracy Storr, CEO and Chief Manufacturer over at the Mammoth Camera Company. This is great stuff going on. John, Tracy, how are you guys doing today? I'm doing great, Scott. I'm great as well. Thanks for having us on. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today here on Inside Analog Photo. We always like to talk about what's going on in the land of the finest, coolest camera made in the 20th century, the large format 20 by 24 Polaroid. Of course, John is with 20 by 24 Studios, and Tracy here is with Mammoth Camera Company. You guys have a really cool announcement that I think shocked a lot of people that I think is fabulous. Yeah, that's right. We announced that 20 by 24 Holdings has commissioned Mammoth Camera, which is Tracy's company, to build two brand new 20 by 24 cameras. This was approved by our investor a couple of weeks ago, and we're incredibly excited about this. Tracy did build a camera last year, which hardly anybody knows about because the client went underground after they had a big shoot. So it never got out. What a great job he did on it. And you can see photos of it posted on our website. So we're just very excited, not only what it means to build new cameras, but what it really means to expanding the reach and the ability of 20 by 24 photography. So let's talk about the reasons for expanding cameras. The two the 20 by 24 Studios has, one in New York City and one in San Francisco. Why do you need more? We get a lot of calls for jobs that it's not worthwhile to take the 20 by 24 out of New York City. Our overhead's very high there, so we don't like to have the camera out for extended periods of travel just to do a one- or two-day job. So it really discourages, like, a quick project in Florida or in Texas or whatever. So that becomes difficult. Also, it's really good to have a backup camera. 
we're really kind of walking the high wire, having one functioning all-in-one camera in New York City. And also we're looking to expand and do international travel and maybe keep a camera over in Asia. We already have one in Europe, so we're mostly looking at Asia. So it doesn't have to travel back and forth a lot. I mean, they're big machines to crate and to ship. It's just not something you want to be moving back and forth on a continuing basis. So to be able to have additional units and place them in places and not have to necessarily worry about a New York-style overhead in any one of those places will allow us, I think, to reach a lot more people and get a lot more jobs, essentially. I mean, you would really think, too, that the one you have, John, and even anyone that's left in the world, these are historic pieces of equipment that should be at the Eastman House, and I would think that if you dropped one of Tracy Newman's off the back of a rider, it wouldn't be the end of the world. You just need to cough up more money. Yeah, they're kind of like a Stradivarius in some levels. Not only do they function very well, but they obviously do have a historic value. We really do want to safeguard them and not be just shipping them at a drop of a hat to Australia. We get requests like this all the time, and a lot of times just the expenses and logistics are just too much to deal with. But also it makes you nervous to send your camera 20,000 miles away and wondering if it's going to come back or get dropped off of a forklift at Narita Airport or something. So it's nice to have multiple units, and it's nice to have the flexibility and the backup of them. So what have you got response-wise from other people in the industry in regards to, hey, we're going to make a couple new cameras? I think it's great that Tracy can even manufacture this thing. But secondary, in this whole convoluted world of digital, that this huge, monster, unbelievable analog process that people now can't even replicate that are trying to, you guys are making more stuff. Yeah, well, we do have a bit of film to go through. And one of the rationales also for expanding the camera market was that we had a real bottleneck trying to run product through one unit primarily in New York and then the second unit in San Francisco, which also goes to L.A., But just given the amount of activity through there, we've got a lot of film, but we also have kind of a clock is ticking on this film, and we can't sort of parcel it out over a 10-year period because it's just not going to physically last that long. So what we'd like to do is get to a point of moving at a good pace so I can keep production going at a good pace and keep my guys in the production part of it active and happy, then get to a point where we can explore, say, in two years, alternate versions of film. And one of our big hopes is that Impossible, who bought the 8x10 line, will look to do a peel-apart product at a certain point for their 8x10 line, and that that may down the road be a possibility for us. It doesn't look like any possibilities with Fuji are really going to work out in the near or long term. So it's to that, to expand the project, to get it going, to move it, and to keep it continuing. And I think making a peel-apart film will be a lot easier than making an integral film. Integral film is the most complex sandwich of stuff that you can imagine. So it'll be great to hopefully move into that. We've been in talks with Impossible along those lines. Do you find no response from Fuji? They are not interested. They want a million dollars worth of film before they'll fire up their machine. What's the thought on why a Fuji product wouldn't be applicable or you couldn't use this? Well, Polaroid had discussions with Fuji in the final days in 2008. We actually tested some material in the first quarter of 2008. They actually flew people over. They'd slit some material to 22 inches. We ran it through a camera in Waltham, which was the factory that Polaroid closed. We made up reagent from a recipe that they had sent from chemicals, and it worked out quite well. But yeah, it's, they just want such huge numbers. They're not really interested in such a niche product. And, of course, we're a niche of a niche. I mean, they're such a huge company. And also, I think one important thing that I see is that the legacy aspects of it, Like with Polaroid, 20 by 24 was such an integral part of the identity of the company and everything, and that's not the case with Fuji. It's just a sale. So they don't have any emotional attachment or thinking. I just don't think they see a huge upside to it. So you need a company with the attitude and the spirit of someone like Impossible Project and Florian Caps, who really kind of embodies the attitudes of land and making this stuff happen and going through some struggles and getting it there, but it's a total labor of love, and you just didn't get the sense of that from Fuji, which is unfortunate. They do make a beautiful product, and it would have been great to have it in the camera, but got to move on. Well, there's always the hope that some rolls of FP100 will fall off the back of a truck somewhere. Yeah, there's always hope. Okay, so, Tracy, we've chatted before about Mammoth Camera, and you basically have completely taken apart the original 20x24, and you guys spec this whole thing out, and now you're actually in the process of making a couple more. Yeah, that's right. A couple years ago, right around the time we got an order for a new camera, I had an opportunity to go to New York. I actually disassembled the camera in John's studio, the 20 by 24 studio in New York. We had found some low mileage spare parts in very good condition, so it was a great opportunity to do some upgrades on the New York camera and at the same time just completely photograph and measure the whole thing from stem to stern. 
and that's how I was able to build the camera last year using photographs and drawings and imported everything into a CAD drawing program refined the drawings and went ahead and had a lot of the parts computer cut and then everything was hand finished in my shop and finally after months and months assembled the whole thing and it looked pretty good we used some interesting materials on that one it was all olive wood but most importantly it worked great so now here we are in 2010 and 20 by 24 holdings john's company wants two more cameras so sure let's do it it's exciting i mean during the process of building the first one it was the first time i had done it there was a lot of stress the budget and the schedule were optimistic at the beginning, to say the least. So it was a tough go. But now I've got that experience of having done it once successfully and a client that certainly understands the process. So it's going to be great. Now, because of the way the camera is constructed and what you were able to actually measure by hand in New York, are we talking that the tolerance on the camera is enough to where it wasn't a big deal to get these and remake these dimensional drawings? You had to bring in an optical comparator, I mean, or you were able to do everything by hand that the tolerances in the camera are enough to where you can be off by a half thou here and there and everything works. Yeah, well, the idea was never that the parts that I'm making would be interchangeable with the original cameras. That would have been to the kind of spec you're talking about. They just have to work. And because all this stuff is all custom made anyway, they're close. And in some cases, some of the parts might be interchangeable. I mean, if John's camera fell off the back of the truck like you're talking about, I could build a new processor and drop it in. It wouldn't be exactly the same as the old one, but it would work the same, which that's the goal. It's a tool. It's a machine for making photographs. It's a unique user interface, camera operator. There aren't a lot of 20 by 24 camera operators. There's John and Jennifer Trouse, John's director of photography in New York, and myself, and Jan Nisdo in Prague, and a few other people around the world who've done it at one time or another. So really, it's just down to what we need to do to make the film come out and look good when we peel it. So let's talk about glass. Now, I know that the original cameras that Polaroid made, Fujian had made special lenses for this stuff. Is there things available today or new old stock or even old stuff that you can put in that still works? What's the availability of glass for this type of camera? Well, for the camera I built last year, I supplied it with a Fuji 600C lens which is a stock Fujinon lens. It comes in a Copal 3. It's really meant as an 8x10 lens, but it actually has tremendous covering power. And we actually use it as a normal lens on 20x24. Historically, in the 70s, Polaroid bought Fujinon A 600 lenses. And those are, I think, actually rarer than hen's teeth these days. But I don't know how many they actually made. I've been using a Fuji C in California for 13 years as my standard lens, and it works great. And when Wisner built cameras, he supplied them with a Fuji C as well. Works very well. And there are also a lot of historical lenses that work, Apo Nikors, Apo Ronars, things like that. So 600 millimeter on a 20 by 24 is going to be equal to what, maybe a 50 on a 35? So people can relate on how this exchanges size-wise? It's slightly wide for the format. 35 is kind of a hard analogy because it's a different shaped rectangle. But 600 is roughly 24 inches, which is the long side of the film. So it would be like using a 70 on 6x7 or a 250 on 8x10. Right. And there's no big difference between the old A and C lens? I mean, the Fuji A, I think it's a bit faster. I'm sure it has better coverage. Actually, when we got a Fuji C back in the day, I compared it to my A one-on-one, and it actually was slightly sharper than the A. Now, it's possible we had some material that worked its way into the elements of the A over the years from screwing it and unscrewing it from the shutter. Because when you pack it up, you take it off the big lens board and you put it in there. So we've since had that cleaned up, so I haven't had a chance to test it between them. But the Fujinon C is a very nice lens. It's certainly adequate to the job, and it's very compact compared to the A. The A has two huge elements, front and rear, that make it quite difficult to transport sometimes. I think it takes like a 95 or 105 millimeter filter or something. I mean, it's huge. The Fuji C is not compromised, actually, at all. No, I don't think so either. And there's nothing longer than the 600, that's it. In terms of modern, Schneider makes 1100 XXL, and they also make a 550 XXL for ultra-large format cameras. They're very expensive, but by all accounts, they're excellent lenses. I actually have not had an opportunity to test them. Schneider rang me up and said they wanted to send them to me to play with. I'd accept in a New York minute. I know a few people who have the 550, and they're very happy with it. But as far as other longer lenses, there are lots and lots and lots of process lenses. Again, the Gertz Red Dot Artars, Rodenstock Apo Ronars, and Apo Nikors, and all sorts of other lenses. And in much longer focal lengths, the 760s, 800s, 1,000 millimeters, 
Longer than 1,000 millimeters almost gets to be too long for 20 by 24, but there are lots and lots of lenses, longer and shorter, that work for various applications. And we're always advising people that are going to come in to rent the studio, well, if you want to do that, we can use this lens, and this is what it's going to look like, et cetera, et cetera. So. Now, really because of the size of the camera and the format that people aren't used to shooting this monster, gigantic format, so people think, well, you have the 600 Fuji C lens that you shoot at what, F16, F22? It's F11 and a half wide open. It comes down to how you're lighting your scene and what the shot is. So with a portrait and not talking about lighting, let's just talk about aesthetics with the 20 by 24 being so large that at F11, is the depth of field just so shallow that there's no way to even really use it, even if you had the sun behind you? And it was just great, fabulous lighting. Well, you could shoot it wide open. The trick then is to make sure your subject doesn't move between the time you <laughs> focus and pick it. And typically in studio situations when we're with a client, we try to be somewhere between 32 and 45. Because even if you have a three-quarter size portrait, the depth of field for that looks like maybe one or two stops down from wide open on two and a quarter. So it sounds great, 32 and a half, but it is in terms of the depth of field. And it's unrealistic to get down to 64. I mean, you would need 30,000 watt seconds of light in a huge softbox, and you would just scare your subject to death, so it's not worth the trouble. I know that what you're using in the studio now in New York is, what, like 10,000 watt seconds? Yeah, we run two by tubes through it, so we'll run 12.8 through a Big Island Chrome for an average lighting situation. It's not the only one. So yeah, around 12,000 watt seconds is kind of average. People aren't used to that. They're not, and we've learned to not even warn them about it. Try to do your metering ahead of time, because if you start popping that, you just kind of really throw them off their game, so you just kind of go for it on that first shot. So, John, you have a fair amount of film. I do. You guys have some film that looks like you're going to last at current consumption for at least a couple years, maybe longer? Probably four, maybe five years. It really depends on what kind of things we put together. Is there a way to keep the receiver positive and negative sheets? Because I know you make fresh pods, so you can make fresh yummy goo whenever you want. But the actual material itself, is there a way to keep it from degrading? Is this in lead line containers somewhere? We do have the negative in cold storage, so that, I believe, can last indefinitely. We haven't refrigerated the sheet. I've been advised not to. We do try to keep it in a controlled environment in terms of humidity and everything. So really, there's not an issue with breakdown so much. So really, the stuff in theory would last at least that long. Because I think what most people find with original Polaroid material is the goo pack dries out and then you're hosed. Yes. I mean, the first thing that starts to happen to pods is that because there's a seal that's designed to break under pressure, that there is a porousness there that eventually will allow oxygen in. When the pods are made, the reagent is injected out of its tank under what we call a nitrogen blanket. So nitrogen is just sort of spilling around. It's not actually under nitrogen or anything or in a sealed chamber. It's just what they call a nitrogen blanket is if you just spread nitrogen in the area, it keeps the oxygen out. So there's a chance that a little bit of oxygen may burst through the blanket and get in there. Most pods start, particularly the larger pods, with a small amount of oxygen in them. So what we've been finding historically is that nine months to 12 months have been the time when they start to deteriorate. And it's a slow process and it's a subtle process initially where perhaps the gloss of the image might deteriorate a little bit. Eventually, you'll see minor oxidation marks, which sort of look like colored wood grain that starts to permeate some of the smooth areas of an image. And then as time goes on and the material does physically start to harden, you get lack of coverage and those kind of things, which some people actually are attracted to. There's a cult of Polaroid now that is based on the end game, where they actually revere the breakdown of the process and actually like and sometimes prefer that. We've never been looking for that for 20 by 24, certainly in smaller format. It's a lot of fun if you're paying a dollar or two per exposure, but sure. our price point is a serious price point, and we have not been entertaining that. Although we do have some clients, like Julian Schnabel, for instance, will entertain anything that goes wrong is a great moment. So he has a very open painterly attitude and likes that kind of stuff, but that's not the majority. So we're still looking to provide as perfect a product as we can for as long as we can, and so we're doing constant testing. I have a former chemical engineer, Ted McClelland, who's my director of research now, who's got a huge binder of projections and things where he'll be keeping a very close eye on this. And we can make adjustments as we go because as the negative ages, you get color shifts and a little bit of speed loss and all of that. And there's a lot you can tweak with the reagent to boost the slope of the film and to move it left, right, up, or down in terms of color balance. So we'll be keeping an eye on that and not making huge batches at any given time just so we don't overcommit in one direction. 
keep a very close eye on things. So it's really guarding a legacy at the same time that you're trying to prep a product to sell. Sure. Tracy, what if someone wants to buy a back? Let's say they want a processor. They're going to build the rest of their own camera, but they want to have your back. Is this a feasibility? I've actually had a couple inquiries on that, and it's a real tough question to answer because, I mean, the back is really the heart of the system. It's also the most expensive, difficult, time-consuming, and precise parts of the whole system. With the cameras I'm about to build, I mean, the back is really part of the whole system, which starts literally from the ground up with the studio stand that supports the whole camera. The way the camera back opens to load it and the sort of clearance you need to pull the photograph out of the bottom of the camera after it's exposed Everything really needs to be part of that system in just clearances, support, and stability. So at the moment, I'm sort of disinclined to do it, and I've had two such inquiries actually in the last six weeks or so. And what I've told them most recently is right now I'm at my capacity in terms of production. I'm going to be building two cameras side by side. I can't really do anything else. And at the end of these two cameras, I'll have a much better idea of what I would have to charge to build just the back. Last time I just charged straight ahead and built a whole camera. I just did what I had to do to get it done. I wasn't doing a lot of bookkeeping in terms of this packet of screws that cost $10 was for the stand, then that packet of screws that cost $20 was for the processor. I didn't do any of that. So this time around, I'll be keeping much more careful track of sort of the bookkeeping end of it as well as just getting it done, which is quite a lot to be getting on with. But if people look at the camera, the back's at least three quarters of it, so you might as well just pony it by the whole thing and you know it works. That's kind of the way I'm leaning, that the back is actually easily two-thirds of the work and two-thirds of the money. So I told a fellow six weeks or so ago that if he wanted to buy just the back, it'd be 50 grand. I didn't hear back from him. What do you find, John, that is the biggest request that people want to do with the product? So, of course, there's going to be some more cameras now, so there's going to be some more flexibility in shooting. But what is the artist photographer wanting to do with a 20 by 24? I mean, what do you see that people want to do with this thing? In the last few years, it's really primarily a portrait machine. If you think of people like Chuck Close and Mary Ellen Mark, Tim Montuani and others, it's just a great portrait machine. There's no doubt about that. Historically, when Polaroid was sponsoring artists, this is going into the mid-80s to the mid-90s or so, You had a lot more variety and experimentation of people doing multi-panel. You'd get sculptors and painters that would come in and sort of adapt their work to it. We've done a small, low-level artist support program that Jennifer Trash has sort of been administering, trying to find younger artists to do things. And we have yet to publish any of that. We're about to put some of it onto our website and things. But she purposely chose very experimental artists who were playing with the process of the image and interfering with the processing, almost like Ellen Carey's work, where you just treat the process almost as like a printmaking process and sort of interfere with it, steer it in different directions. It's great in that regard. It's not often considered to be a physical process, but it's almost like printmaking and photography at the same time. If you think about the variances of printmaking, like, say, silkscreen, where it's how you squeegee it and what inks you do, how you mask versus how you prepare stones and lithography or with intaglio, those sort of things. There's a lot of aspects of 20 by 24, A, because of the scale, and B, because of the actual physicality of the material, that you can actually introduce a lot of physical scenarios into the process that can really alter the image and sort of take it to a completely different level. So we want to try to expand those aspects of the project and not make it just straight retail situation, where only the really wealthy can get at it. The heart and soul of the project historically has come from getting young blood and new blood in there. And so we're going to continue to try to find ways to do that. And at the same time, those who can and wish to afford to do it can certainly do anything they want. But on that level, so far, it's been, I would say, 85% portraiture. So really then, with your sort of mission statement for 2024, isn't so much about making as much money as possible. So your investor must have some keen interest in the arts and want to keep things alive. He's also president of the Lincoln Center Film Society, which puts on the New York Film Festival. And one of the ideas of his and his excitement about building two new cameras was to have a camera available to the Lincoln Center Film Society because they have a lot of programs where they have directors and actors and people coming through and to use one of the cameras to document a lot of that. There actually has been a nice legacy of film sort of relationships with it, mostly in Europe. We've been to Sundance a few times, and it's just great. We've gone with Timothy Greenfield Sanders once and Kevin Mazur where you get all the actors and things. It's just a great thing that goes on with that. But over in Europe, they've been doing Cannes and the Berlin Film Festival and the Venice Film Festival for many, many years. And so there's a whole archive of that. And that, of course, is portraiture as well, but it's almost using it as a documentary sort of thing. But just the relationship that filmmaking has to 20 by 24 is kind of a special one. A 
few weeks ago. It was the closing day of the film festival in New York. Clint Eastwood's film, The Hereafter, was being screened, and so we were able to bring the camera there. And Chuck Close, we'd been working with him a few days before, volunteered to do the first portraits for the Film Society's archive. So Chuck Close did Clint Eastwood and Matt Damon as the kickoff for that. So we're looking forward to using that as another point in New York City where we have the freedom to do a lot more than looking to do advertising, editorial, and artist work in our commercial studios. So it gives us sort of a two-prong ability and just a way to expand it and have obviously a little bit more fun with it as well. So I'm sure people are wondering when 2024 Studios is going to come out with their Photoshop plug-in to emulate your process. <laughs> I haven't seen that yet by anybody. Maybe there's an opportunity there. You've got to get the good edges first. So you've got to have at least one real print to get a high-res scan <laughs> to get those edges. And I can spot a fake a mile away. You don't do the transitions because it's not like a cutout around the border. There's a subtle sort of movement work that goes into there. But the photo itself belies that. I mean, generally, smaller format stuff with a 20 by 24 border just looks weird because it seems so obvious that it's not a 20 by 24 by just the optical sort of presentation of the image and the way the focus falls off and everything. There's a very distinct look to 20 by 24 that's pretty hard to fake. But we live in a world of fakery, and we're fine with it. People know the real deal when they see it, and it's sort of original object imaging. It's the print itself, the real print. Reproduction, 20 by 24s often lose a lot of their power, so they're almost like paintings in that regard, that you have to see the real object, and we're fine with that. Well, no, it's the truth, and I think any instant analog process, you can't replicate it, even small stuff. It doesn't look right. No, it's true, and again, it comes down to the physicality of the medium. You've got dyes going from one side to the other, there's a thickness to the material. It's sort of liquidy when it first comes out. There's lots of sort of potential for interference, for good or for bad, with the materials. And how you pull, what the temperature is, those kind of things will all influence how the images look. And for many, many years, quite honestly, from Polaroid's perspective, and even mine and Tracy's running cameras, is you fought against that as much as you could because you felt like your competition was the perfection of the analog competition which was C-prints or black and white prints or whatever, where they had the huge advantage where you do your image capture and you get a negative and then you take the time to print. When you do everything at once, there's a lot of stuff that can happen to influence the way it comes out, some for good and some for not so good. So if you have temperature problems and all of that, I think what we've come to see now is that the level of digital with the 21 megapixel cameras and just the optics and all those things, there is a level of perfection photographically is unquestioned. And what people have seemed to enjoy, not everyone does, I and mean, there are a lot of people who don't want to do film, and I think everyone still has a romantic feeling for film if they don't use it or not. But there is a lot of people who just really prefer, and it's not for all their work. Like Tim Montuani is a great example because he shoots all of his NFL stuff with Canon digital things, and he loves it. It's perfect for that application. But when he wants to do something meaningful and special, he turns to the large format Polaroid. And he shoots other Polaroid formats as well when he can get the film. So I think you have a lot of that. It's not an all-or-nothing sort of thing where you're on one side of the fence or the other, but I think there's certainly an appreciation of analog, particularly instant analog, because it's the instant feedback part of it is just so important to your reaction and relationship with the imagery that you're making. It's so true. It's just like you said, when you peel even current Fuji pack or anything, anything you can get your hand on, you peel it, you're hoping the goo doesn't hit all the way to the end. And there's streaks, <laughs> yeah, right. and it's just like, whoa, I scored, look at this. Like you said, it's a very super highly complex chemical analog reaction going on. It's Mm -hmm. really magic to most people. Yeah, and having been on the end where I see the barrels and bottles and vats of chemistry that we have in our warehouse that we mix together, my guys do it from a spreadsheet, and we put it into this crazy-looking machine that's a chemical reactor. It spins, and it's under vacuum, and it's under nitrogen, and it comes squeezing out into these big cans. And then we take those cans, and we run it through this crazy pod machine. The miracle really presents itself then. You really realize, wow, this is an amazing process. So, Tracy, you're shooting, of course, the other camera for 2024 Studios on the West yes. Coast. You're still getting a fair amount of work out of the entertainment Hollywood sector? A bit, yeah. In fact, the most recent big project we did was a client who worked both with us here in San Francisco and had me bring the camera down to L.A. for a shoot. And they also did several shoots in New York with John and Jennifer. It's a multimedia entertainment company, and they were working on a book project and had us in tow to make portraits of these figures, and it was a great project. We look forward to doing more stuff like that as well. And of course, didn't you go down with the camera with Tim Burton and did the whole Alice in Wonderland gig, right? Right. Mary Ellen Mark, who has done a lot of film work in small format as well as 20 by 24 sort of behind the scenes and still portraits, 
she's worked with Tim a lot over the years. So it was, gosh, about two years ago that I went down to Culver City where they were shooting Alice in Wonderland. And we had about a week where we had the camera there on set and all the talent came in in full hair and makeup. Johnny Depp and Helena Bonham Carter and just the whole cast, we brought them in and shot a really unique series of portraits. This summer, John and I both went to Texas again to shoot with Mary Ellen portraits of Jeff Bridges and Matt Damon for a Coen Brothers project. John, you were talking about going to Sundance. I took the camera for years, every year, down to the Independent Spirit Awards for InStyle magazine. And a couple of years ago, they had an editorial shakeup, but that was a nine-year project where we went every year. So let's say I want to have Tracy bring the 20 by 24 to my wedding in Culver City in Marin County, somewhere where you can travel to. Is this a feasibility that someone can say, hey, bring the camera down, I want you to shoot portraits at my wedding? I mean, it's theoretically possible. Anytime I go to pretty much anywhere on the West Coast, I literally pick up a rental truck and load the camera in and drive it. I've had the camera up to Seattle and to Los Angeles and as far away as Santa Fe, which is a little more of a schlep than I'm comfortable doing in a truck. But I'll do estimates based on the client's needs and wishes. So, I mean, if you've got an event or a project that you want to do and you don't want to come to San Francisco to do it, we can come to you. It just has to be what it has to be. We're there to make sure you understand the process and have a realistic expectation, but then to make sure you get the shot. So, John, the film is $200 an image now? That is our suggested list retail price, yes. Okay, and then what's it cost to bring this thing out? I guess we can sit down and say, okay, I'm a boomer and I got some cash, brother. I want to take some pictures (laughs) of my dog, okay? So I want to come down and use this thing and learn how it works. Let's talk about studio use versus having you, or even more so, let's say Tracy, because maybe he's a little more mobile, to take this thing out and yard it into the Hilton Ballroom somewhere. Well, our daily rental in New York City is seventeen fifty, which is higher than the San Francisco rental because we have a big overhead. New York rental in that place is quite expensive. So that's sort of set rate. We generally don't discount beyond that to take it out because it is a big deal to take it out, and we take all of our lights with us generally and all of that. So it's usually the same day rate when we go out. And we actually do a surprising amount of work outside of our studio within New York City. We have a dedicated driver, Tribeca Moving Company, that takes us out, and he's got a big lift gate and real careful. He's got a lot of experience in the photo industry. He used to work with Greg Heisler and do a lot of that. So he's very sensitive to the nature of the stuff we're moving around, so it works out really great for us. I mean, it was a nightmare before we got him to do location in New York because we'd rent a van, and then you drop all the stuff off, and that means somebody has to now do something with the van. New York is not very friendly for parking anything, let alone a 14-foot truck or a cargo van. So that was always difficult and all of that. So now that we have this guy, it's a lot better. Now, if it's long-distance travel, we try to put together packages. A, how many days is it going to be? B, how far away is it? Is it a truck job? Is it a plane job? For Austin, for instance, we air freighted the equipment out there. So there's a lot of particulars that come into all of that. But mostly, if you're looking at location far away, I think if you budget an average like $3,000 a day for your rental and film costs, and then depending if it's flown or not, you have your travel expenses on top of that. And then, of course, if Tracy and or I go, there's the wine bill that always has to be considered. <laughs> right. you got to pay the technicians and the artists. Yeah, we have to be properly lubricated to work <laughs> multiple day shoots. So a case of film is six grand. How many images can I get out of a case? Ideally 45, particularly with the all-in-one systems. One of the problems with the portable Wisner units, by the nature of the design of the cassette going through this processing system, on every exposure, it had to have a longer leader of about seven or eight inches. So it dropped your film yield down to about 37. So for that reason, we certainly prefer and try to steer people towards an all-in-one solution. But also, what we learned is that the all-in-one systems, by nature of being stable, that is, you're not taking the cassette off of a camera and then back to a processor where it's a 35-pound box full of film and it's top-heavy because the negative's up there. So the alignment as it went through the rollers and everything could change every time. And so there was a huge amount of variability to those systems, particularly when the film emerged to the price point that it did when we bought it all that it's very difficult to make the case for the Wisner system just because they're not as reliable as the all-in-ones or as stable as the all-in-ones. So we also kind of discourage jury rigging the back onto an existing camera because what we feel is that the savings of doing that will be more than offset by losing too much film. There's nothing more frustrating than losing the film for sort of those kind of reasons. It's one thing to make a mistake about setting an f-stop or something, but when the processor is giving you all this interference and difficulties, it can get very frustrating. 
And what we found over the years is a lot of the people who did purchase those portable systems stopped buying film after one or two cases just because it was so either A, physically difficult, or B, they were not getting the results that they wanted. People, they come into the studio and they see Tracy and or I or Jennifer running the system and they see the whole shoot going. They don't realize that there's a lot of sophisticated talent that's actually making that happen and making it look smooth and making it look seamless. And then you get the thing yourself and you realize, whoa, there's a lot to do here. I mean, it's not super difficult or it requires a certain kind of intelligence. It's just practice makes perfect and everything. It's like trying to be a film director and run your own Panavision camera at the same time, worrying about all of that and worrying about the lighting. It's just an efficiency of a creative team doing something. It's just better to have the artist or the director of their shoot focusing on his image and not have to focus on all this equipment and physical stuff and all of that. I mean, it's pretty difficult to wear all those kind of hats on a 20 by 24 shoot. So really, though, if I want to do something either in San Francisco or in New York City, I can pay my studio fee, and I don't have to buy a whole case. I can buy one shot, 10 shots. Yeah, that's why the price point difference, if you multiply out 45 times 200, it's $9,000. And where that differential comes into is that that's the service aspect of providing it and steering you and guiding you towards that. And we make a certain amount of guarantee for the quality of what it is. If there's a decision made by the photographer that causes a problem, that's one thing. But we're able to absorb film problems and those kind of things for the extra money. So the $200 a pop gig says when you pull the trigger, there's going to be something that's going to come out. Yeah, given our experience level and all that, I'd say 95% of the time you're there. If anyone's even done their own 8x10 shoot with Polaroid all by themselves, probably encountered a rate not quite so good as that. Just things happen. You've got to really focus all the time with those cameras because someone could be talking to you and there's all this feel and stuff that people just don't understand unless you run a camera of what it's like, of what you have to focus on for the few moments that the film's coming out of the camera and handling it, and it's fragile until you get it safely onto the peeling table and all of that. I mean, there's a dozen different elements that can come in and cause something to possibly go wrong, and so you want that kind of experience to deliver the product. And that's what we deliver with the rental package. So it's not so much just a purchase of product, but it's really a full service package that we look to offer with the studios that we have here in the U.S. So where do people find out about Mammoth Camera? Where can they find out more information, Tracy, about what you're doing? Let's say they've been saving all this money for 40 years, and I'm going to go dump 75 k and live out the dream. Well, they can contact me at my website, mammothcamera.com. I don't have a website to do for an update for sure, but right there on the homepage, I've got a link to a page with some more information about the cameras, as well as a link to my Flickr page, which currently showcases a gallery of photographs of sort of the making of the camera that I built last year. So lots of pictures of my greasy hands holding gears, which I made fresh off the mill, things like that. A real sort of do-it-yourselfers dream in a way. But I just thought people might be interested in seeing some of those how-to pictures of making my own washers and making my own gears and things like that. I mean, I'm a machine gearhead type of cat, so I like it when someone tools up. It's like hardcore. I love it. We'll certainly take advantage of our website, which is 20x24studio.com, and our Facebook page, which probably actually gets more views per day than our actual website. I think we just went over 1,900 fans, and we usually have about 600 people a day actually actively looking at that. So that's a good platform and vehicle for us. And maybe we'll even consider spinning out a Mammoth Camera fan page and try to build the audience for that, just so people can see what's going on without revealing too much about how it's built, because we don't want to give right away any, any Mammoth Camera secrets. But just the excitement as the things come together, and it's like the Golden Gate Bridge, just watching the photos of that going across. It's always kind of great to see after the fact. There'll be a lot of updates going on, and maybe we'll even, at some point, try to do some videos. I think it would be great. I'm ready to shoot more 2024 video as well, so we can converge at Tracy's secret lair and record him machining and throwing metal chips on the ground. You guys can come watch the industrial abrasive water jet machine fire up. I actually would like to see that. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So I'll be shooting some video of that. That's not here at my place. It lives in its own building. It's all good fun, though. There's nothing like 10,000 PSI water with some garnet thrown in for fun. Exactly. Gentlemen, I really appreciate you guys joining today, of course, Tracy with the Mammoth Camera Company and John with 20 by 24 It's just fabulous to hear news about basically the late, great, coolest analog process of the 20th century. I mean, if you come down to it and all the things that have been done with analog capture, I really think that the Polaroid process is pretty much top number one. And it's so cool to see that things keep progressing and you have such a fabulous investor that is interested in the arts and to keep this stuff alive because without people like him, well, it would all be in a dumpster somewhere. Exactly. Um, yeah, we're really fortunate to have a person behind us that we do. His name is Dan Stern, and we're very, very appreciative of everything he's done for us. 
and just the approach he's taking and the patience and all of that. It's been very gratifying, and we couldn't have landed with a better person. No, it's great stuff. And gentlemen, I appreciate you joining us today. Always great to have the updates. And, of course, we're going to be talking more about 2024 and a lot of great stuff coming here in the future. So, again, thank you, gentlemen, so much for taking time out of your day to chat about this fabulous announcement. Thanks. Okay, my pleasure. Well, there you go. John Ruder, Tracy Store, the 20 by 24 camera, the most incredible process of the 20th century. That's right. This is unique, true, original Polaroid instant photography. This is unbelievable. They're making brand new cameras. This is great news. Very cool to hear about this traditional process. It's unbelievable. Definitely check out the websites for John Ruder and Tracy Store. Fabulous news in the world of analog photography. The Inside Analog Photo Radio Program has been brought to you by Fujifilm for their full line of instant cameras and film. And, of course, fine quality Fuji Crystal Archive paper over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional. Our friends at Photo Publicist, worldwide publicity, strategic promotion, social media marketing, and business development over at www.photopublicist.com. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab for the finest quality lab in the country, richardphotolab.com. Our friends over at DR5 for black and white chrome at dr5.com. Upstrap for the finest quality camera strap that will not slide off your shoulder at upstrap-pro.com. Our friends over at Iger Studios at igerstudios.com. And, of course, our media partners of the Analog Photography User Group at apug.org. And our official philanthropic partner, George Eastman House, over at eastmanhouse.org. I've been your host, Scott Shippard, here on Inside Analog Photo. We'll be back next week with more great analog photography.